Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's good to see all of you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm John Osp. I'm the gallery director for the College of Art and Design at RIT, which uh, includes uh, RIT City Art Space. It's not far from here. It's on the corner of Main Street and East Avenue in the historic Sibley Building. And on view right now at City Art Space through February 18th, 2024, is an installation by Nicholas Galanin called, I think it goes like this, Gold. The work is on loan from Art Bridges and Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. And the exhibition, along with Galanin's visit to Rochester, including the talk this evening, would not have been possible without the generous support of Art Bridges. So I just want to thank the Art Bridges Foundation and staff for their generous support and collaboration in making this project a reality. I also want to extend gratitude to the RIT College of Art and Design, the Anna Valerian Visiting Artist Series, uh, Dr. Julie Decker, and the RIT Museum Studies Program, who's my collaborator on these events, and Memorial Art Gallery. And I especially want to thank Chio Yama at MAG for her efforts to help bring Nicholas's talk here this evening. This is really the first time that City Art Space and MAG have uh, collaborated on a program like this, so we're thrilled to partner with MAG and bring tonight's talk both to RIT audiences, but also MAG audiences and extended Rochester communities. So my gratitude, thank you, Chio, and also to Nick Marshall for your help uh, ushering this project. Nicholas will be shortly uh, up here sharing some images and guiding us through some of his work and experiences. And then we'll have a few minutes after for Q&A, uh, should you have them. And I uh, just want to thank my student staff this evening, Silver, Skylar, Mason, for helping out with that and other logistics this evening. Uh, before we get started, though, I've been given permission to read Memorial Art Gall Gallery's land acknowledgement. The Memorial Art Gallery of the University of Rochester sits on the lands of the Haudenosaunee people, specifically the Seneca Nation. These lands were the traditional territory of the Seneca prior to their removal through invasion and occupation, as well as deceptive and broken agreements. The lands continue to serve as home to the native peoples and cultures who have lived here for centuries. Stories of creation, ancestors, spiritual life, and the struggle for survival and identity live today in this land. We honor the rich culture, heritage, and contributions of native peoples and their stewardship of the land that we now occupy. We're keenly aware of the role that museums have played in contributing to the struggles faced by Native Americans. As an art museum, we're committed to working toward dismantling the systems of oppression that have impacted the lives of Native Americans both historically and presently. We're committed to working across all facets of our institution to address the long history of the invisibility of Native Americans. We aim to promote the important and myriad contributions to art, culture, and society of Native Americans in order to affect positive change in our community. RIT also has a land acknowledgement that we typically read uh, at our public events as well, and I think there's certainly important components in our public conversations, especially as educational and collecting and exhibiting institutions. But I'm also aware of some of the problematic aspects of land acknowledgements as they can become subject to routines of formality. In fact, I'm thinking of a particular columnist for The Atlantic who criticized land acknowledgements, saying that the acknowledgement relie relieves the speaker and the audience of the responsibility to think about indigenous peoples, at least until the next public event. And so in addition to land acknowledgements, uh, which are important, it's even more important, I think, to listen to contemporary indigenous voices. And Nicholas Galanin is one of the most exciting leading of these voices, especially in contemporary art right now. If you look at the piece at City Art Space, a little preview there for you, uh, it ha appears to be a chopped up totem pole. And you might ask, why would an artist take an ax to their own work? But if you look at it a little more and kind of learn about it, you find out that the totem pole itself was not made by Galanin. It certainly could have been. Galanin was raised in uh, traditional craft making and uh, wood carving, jewelry making, et cetera, and more. But he actually purchased this totem pole from a Malaysian artist who makes these and sells them as souvenirs for tourists in Alaska. 
So he purchased this from that artist, treated it with gold leaf, and then chopped it up into pieces, showing it then as his own, essentially deconstructing what could have been a tokenized object, a relic of a kind of false nostalgia or of a past indigenous culture. But Galanin reclaims it as contemporary indigenous art of a contemporary indigenous culture. And I think you find a lot of that in his work threading through all of the different media that he works with. What's interesting about this particular sculpture um, or installation is that uh, the hosting art space, whoever is exhibiting the work, can choose to arrange it and um, display it the way they want to. So it looks different every time it's shown. And it's also really a privilege to be able to, in a way, collaborate with the artist and take on the responsibility, not only of handling the work, but of the way it's perceived in our space. And I think um, that goes to never losing the core idea that's evident in the title of this work, which is, I think it goes like this. So I think you'll see these threads uh, moving through uh, Glannon's work, uh, because as an interdisciplinary artist, um, Galanin was born and lives in Sitka, Alaska. He's Clinkit and Anunga. And he makes work that emphatically reveals contradictions and inconsistencies in the mixed iconographies of Western and indigenous cultures. Galanin's work has been showed and shown and uh, collected widely. Most recently, he had a solo uh, presentation at the Armory Show in New York. Uh, he was part of the 2019 Whitney Biennial. He just opened a solo exhibition earlier this month at Site Santa Fe in New Mexico called Interference Patterns. And he's also done major outdoor installations uh, in, for the Desert X Biennial in California, uh, as well as a recent installation that's still on view at Brooklyn Bridge Park called In Every Language There Is Land, which I expect uh, Nicholas will mention shortly. Uh, Nicholas has been on a nonstop tour over the last few weeks and months. I think he's a little road wary, uh, but he's spent the last few days with us, visiting with students and classes in their studios on the RIT campus as part of his visit to Rochester. Nicholas, we're grateful for the time you've spent with us this week and for sharing your work and your voice with us tonight. So with that, if you would, please help me welcome Nicholas Glennon. Thank you. Goodness, cheese. Ye had seen you hot do a sock. Look na huddy hut city. Kagwantan yadi ayahat cheek kakwan. My name is Yehi Atsin, Nicholas Galanin. I am Hluknahadi, child of the Kaguantan, people of Sitka. Grateful to be here. Uh, had a really great visit with a lot of students this past few days. And um, it's my first time in Rochester. So uh, again, thank you all for showing up here. I wanted to clarify one thing with this work here. Uh, <clears throat> the work was commissioned by um, non-indigenous entrepreneurs who hired cheap labor in, in uh, Indonesia to create the work. So uh, this work will be on exhibit at the gallery, City Art Space, right? So if you get a chance, please do go visit. I wanted to share a little bit of imagery from where I come from. Uh, the core of my existence and understanding of place in this world, understanding of my practice, um, and I think understanding of each other stems from, from land and sea. Um, this is Sitka, small coastal community in southeast Alaska. Uh, it's my ancestral homelands. We live very close to the uh, calendar of, of season, and our idea of time is different than a, a uh, capitalist calendar with 40-hour work weeks and um, 
holidays and weekends. Our idea of time is seasons or salmon. Uh, and we harvest and sustain our families as we always have since time immemorial in these spaces. Um, in Tlingit culture, the bear taught us how to survive our on the land. And you can see here, this is that readout where we dip net sockeye, sockeye salmon um, alongside these bears in the summer months. Harvesting is uh, a form of memory. It's a form of love and care. It's a form of uh, understanding. We work together and smoke our fish, uh, oftentimes as a family, extended family. I will probably provide for maybe 10 families during these abundant months doing, doing this type of work, labor, survival. This work, this place, this land also connects to continuum. I come from a history and lineage of artists. Uh, um, my father was a jeweler, sculptor, my uncle, my mentor, my great grandfather. Um, and I still do this work in, in our community. Um, I call it life work. I was trained as a wood, wood carver and jeweler. Um, and I continually practice in passing that knowledge down to next future generations. This image is of Douglas Village. Um, in 1962, the Indian village in Douglas, which is near my community, Juneau, was purposefully burnt down by the city um, to remove, displace, and um, build a boat harbor and parking lot in that space. Um, this was not that long ago. This is... Um, a reminder that colonization is still currently happening, and this time is happening in 4K with hashtags in our pockets, on our phones, globally, in different spaces and places, displacing people from their homelands. I was asked to lead a 42-foot Kutia project um, for the Yan Yedi uh, Hlingit clan that came from that village site. Um, this was a healing pole, Kutia. The healing totem pole uh, was carved over maybe eight to 10 months, probably 10 months um, in 2017. I had five apprentices working with me and we worked closely with the elders in the community to portray and tell and represent the Yan Yedi people and their relationship to that place. Here it was on that village site, um, raised, I believe, maybe in 2018. Um, and there is a gentleman in the black, John Morris. Let's see if this pointer works. Aha, uh -huh. right there. That was um, it was a child when that when his village was was removed. So, for me, the healing of this took place in multiple forms. One was um, care for the elders in the community and representing their voice, their history, and their story. Uh, the other aspect was the process of transferring knowledge through apprenticeships and mentoring next generations of artists that continue, that will and are continuing this work still. Twenty nineteen, twenty twenty, maybe. I think, yep. This COVID years are 
melded together, uh, was asked to carve a yacht, a canoe, a dugout canoe for Gold Belt Heritage in Juneau. Um, the top was the red cedar tree as it arrived, and then about one year later, the dugout steamed and ready for paint. Um, the tree here was older than America, probably 500 years old. Um, and the canoe and this process and knowledge of creating these canoes, um, something that I've been handed through my family and from working with other master artists uh, through apprenticeship is a rare form of technology and knowledge, I suppose, that um, hasn't been practiced as much in our communities as we've been displaced. Um, this statue is of Seward, William Seward. October 18th was Alaska Day in my community, and uh, Alaska Day is a colonial holiday that celebrates the uh, purchase of unceded indigenous land um, from Russian to American colonial and imperial governments. Um, this purchase and exchange took place behind my old studio in Sitka. Um, and in 2017, the capital, the city of Juneau, erected this bronze at a time where many monuments were questioned, many monuments um, across the world were critically being looked at and who they represent and which side of history is being portrayed. Um, and I think you get the idea of the general answer to what that is. Uh, as a response, the Sea Alaska Heritage um, commissioned 30 totem poles to be carved by artists across uh, Southeast Alaska from different communities to be raised in Juneau. Um, I was invited to carve one of them, and uh, we raised this this year in, 20, 20, in May 23. Again, working with apprentices, um, in about 10 months' time, 13 totems so far have been uh, raised in the capital in Juneau. I don't know if I have an image of this one standing. So my practice um, and life work continues still in that side of uh, cultural and community work. Um, I wanted to share some mono prints with you in reference to some of the images I've shared with you, um, I like to think of these mono prints in process as a um, gesture of a fleeting capture to create the imagery here. So on the left are um, images of tools, tools we make to create our ceremonial works. So we, when we carve these totem poles, we create all of our tools first. Um, and so this is a reference to that. What have we become? 2,000 anthropological texts cut and bound. Um, in this case, the text here is under Mount St. Elias, a three-part Smithsonian uh, study on indigenous Tlingit communities. Oftentimes these community, or oftentimes this text is um, romanticized at a, pre, at a contact, like colonial contact period. Um, the text is homogenized from outside scholars of our community, of our elders, knowledge and words. Um, that homogenized 
writing and knowledge, uh, knowledge is generally not validated until it goes through that source. Again, without us involved in that. Um, I was studying in London at the time and really alongside studying my cultural work, um, during that period I was consuming as much literature and writing as I could about my culture. And one thing that became highly apparent was that I had to filter everything due to the lenses that were portraying um, our community. It was not, uh, more than often, it was never writers from our community telling our stories. So this is a two-part piece. I'm going to move forward to the second part. that there. Uh, Suhedi Shugak Tutan translates to, we'll again open this container of wisdom that's been left in our care. This works a celebration of culture and the necessity of contribution over consumption. 
uh, in this two-part series, I feel like the philosophy to me for this work was um, the container of wisdom that this references is, is our language, our cultural knowledge, our visual artwork, our dance, and everything that we are. And coming from a community where everything's been detracted continually, including our authenticity via blood quantum from us, um, I realized how constrictive a romanticized um, idea of us c could be. This was a response to that work, or to that uh, reality. Um, and the response was also a reminder that we have, we have the um, keys to our future of sovereignty and how we portray our cultural output and existence. Fair warning, a sacred place. Audio loops play recording of contemporary auctions of Native American art. The auctioneers repeatedly announce fair warning before sold. Who is selling, who is buying, and what relationship or claim do they make to the art and culture they are trafficking? These are images and photographs um, accompanied by audio, which I'll play for you. The work, the photos were taken at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City uh, in the Great Northwest Hall. Many of our objects that have been stolen or removed from our communities exist in these spaces. Um, this particular installation had been up for 75 years uh, without any change or shift, and I caught the museum um, deinstalling this for remodel at time and, and created these works from that. This work envisions um, a better way of caring for these objects by removing them and returning them back to the communities that they've come from. All right, five one, three six, fourteen hundred. Here's 12, two Pueblo items. There they are, and phones are coming in here. We can start this at 2,000 only. $2,000 here, $2,000 there. 2,200 is bid, 2,200 there, 25, 2,800. 3,000 ahead of you. It is with the internet at 3032 if you wish, yes or no. It's here and selling for 3000 You're out. 32 will be next. Selling them for 3000 though, to the internet, if no more. Fair warning. Thank you. 5155 for 3000 13 of Pueblo Shield. Phone's coming in here, and we can start this at 3000 3,000 is there. 3,000, 3,200 now. 3,200, go 35, 35, 38. 3,800 now. 3,800 now, go four. 3,800 is the bid, four will be next. We all done all through at 3,800, yes or no, at 3,800, fair warning, four in time. 4,000 is here with not yours. It's with the internet at 4,000, 42 if you wish. Yes or no? 4,000 with the internet and selling for 4,000 if no more. Fair warning. The installation asserts the presence of contemporary indigenous people, the capacity to see without being seen, and the desire to exist without being fed upon. Architecture of Return Escape, Metropolitan Museum of Art, this is the first in a series of Hyde paintings guiding the escape of indigenous remains and objects in non-indigenous institutions to return to their home communities. Architecture of Return Escape Metropolitan Museum of Art is a mapped escape plan for objects held in the Met in New York City. 
The work is a plan for wayfinding during decolonization, requiring return, building new structures for good ways of being of the few objects held in display cases, many more including human remains and ceremonial objects not intended for public view are held in museum archives. The cost and process required to travel and visit these archives limits access to the cultural knowledge and inheritance for indigenous communities and continues the removal of the objects from their land and people. While institutions control the air temperature, humidity, UV exposure and dust, they are unable to adequately care for these objects in culturally or spiritual ways. Ancestral map of return, 2023. First, uh, the first of ancestral mapping series of Hyde paintings expanding on the architecture of return series. It's a guide for the escape of indigenous remains and objects in non-indigenous institutions to return to their home communities. Over 130,000 indigenous remains are in institutions still today, universities and museums. Ancestral map of return is a star map invoking the vastness of indigenous celestial knowledge and the innumerable stars and their correlation to vast collections of indigenous remains held in museum and university collections worldwide. Each speck of light represented on the hide stands for an indigenous person of whom a part is held unwillingly in a collection and for their descendants and ancestors awaiting their release. The work is a plan for wayfinding, a map of origination, and a reminder that the return is a requirement for collective liberation. Purchase. Purchase is a set of copper lock picks, handmade and engraved. Each pick holds text from provenance cards. In this case, it's text from cards I've uh, read while visiting the Museum of Natural History's archives in New York. The words engraved in English include collected from a shaman's grave, primitive art, purchase, ceremonial hat from grave. Each piece of text points sharply to the history of theft labeled as collection and of coerced exchange due to dire conditions enforced by the buyer upon the seller being labeled as purchase. Incised into lockpicks, the words become rejoiners to the institutions and collections built on this kind of collection and purchase, which is nearly all of them. They're more than that. They're suggestive, instructive even. Suggestive that knowledge can increase agency, that rules, the rules of institutional display cases are built with were never applied to those who built the containers separating indigenous people from the cultural objects they belong with. Instructive that locks can be picked. I have a solo exhibition at Site Santa Fe that's currently up and here's one image from one of the gallery spaces. Uh, the blue hides from Architecture of Return could be seen on the wall in the center is imaginary Indian um, totem pole. I don't have it. I don't believe I have a detailed shot in this presentation, but it's um, wallpaper motifs painted over tourist curio totem totem poles. Anakiana Dean. It's flowing through it. Is a consideration of persistence and consequences of resistance. Formally, the work references museum displays of indigenous North American and African basketry, wall home decor, and cinematic identification of thieves via ski mask cutouts incised into each basket. This work insists on the persistence of indigenous connection to land and culture through continuum and memory, embodied in, embedded in bodies, objects, and languages. Indigenous continuum like water is capable of gentle, imperceptible movement and sudden force, able to shape and wear down stone. A lot of our existence has been criminalized as indigenous people, whether that's access to or protecting the environment or water, whether it's access to our bringing home our objects. 
in earlier this year, I was invited to Liverpool to participate in the Liverpool Biennial um, Threat Return. There's a series of cast bronze works, similar to the previous basket work I was just showing you. Um, Liverpool's collect connection to uh, colonization, genocide, human trafficking, and violence is it's a direct connection to the U.S. here in many ways. Um, upon my visit, the tobacco industry um, was one of the largest um, economic growth factors of that era that made Liverpool uh, extremely wealthy in a time period where in, um, enslaved humans were forced into labor, oftentimes on indigenous land where indigenous communities were displaced to fund colonization essentially through tax paying, um, through taxes from this tobacco trade and industry. I wanted to do some bronze work that was placed in, in the um, gardens here at one of the central parks in Liverpool. A lot of the bronzes and street names in Liverpool were funded by those that built their wealth during that time through trafficking um, and through enslaved laborers. Um, they documented themselves essentially in bronze and their names as well. So this work was placed alongside them and in, and in conversation with, with, with them for the duration of the Liverpool Biennial. White flag. White flag is synonymous throughout the world as a sign of surrender, truce, or desire to engage in battlefield negotiations. White flag is a flag made from the hide of a polar bear shot and turned into a rug in the 1920s by a sport hunter of European descent. Biting a link cut from a tree serving as a flagpole, the bearskin stretches flat across the wall as if in a strong wind no longer able to move freely. This work rep reflects the state of the Arctic and the vast global effects of human-driven climate change on all life. We Dreamt Deaf, a taxidermy polar bear shot in 1970s in Shishmaroff by a white sport hunter. The village now being swallowed by a rising sea melts into trophy form. We Dreamt Deaf is half animal, half rug fixed and struggle to survive an unsustainable condition. With this title, we are all implicated in participating in the anthropocentric industrial dream that renders us deaf to our impact on all of our relatives, human and non-human. Speaking to colonizers and colonized, to generations past and future, the humans as an animal forgetful of our place in the world. This work speaks of losing sight and sound of what is done to us and by us, of how we are living, what is being lost through our taking. The polar bear is an iconic symbol of struggle for survival of animals and cultures who have been decimated through colonial corporate enterprises focused on extraction from land and development of capital without care for consequence. This image that I wanna share with you is from Seattle protests uh, in 2020, um, protests that were actually going global at the time, I suppose, and um, protests for brown and black lives being extra ju ju judicially murdered by police officers, historically. I wanted to show this image because we see the gentleman here with the wood carving in his hand um, his name is Rick Williams, and in 2010, 10 years prior to this photograph, uh, his brother was murdered by Officer Ian Burke of the Seattle Police Department. He was a wood carver who was crossing the crosswalk in broad daylight, shot four times in the back with his wood carving and his wood carving knife in hand. This is, uh, this is not new. 
Statistically, Native Americans are at the highest risk of being killed by police officers. The precedent for this behavior has been well established throughout the history of the United States, in which military, cavalry, and settlers were legally protected and often rewarded for murdering indigenous men, women, and children. God complex. God complex stretches riot police off armor in the shape of a Christ figure, crucified without a cross or body. The opalescent glazed porcelain helmet, body armor, baton, embody the fragility of the epistemology they espouse and protect. This work makes visible the American belief and faith in the police state, with the riot cop cast as a martyr to the cause of blind obedience rather than an enforcer of terror and fear. God complex references a long history of religion as justification for state violence and violence visited upon indigenous communities by the church itself. The preciousness of glazed porcelain and the pose itself reference religious figurines, while the absence of a cross or body points to the emptiness of belief and the persecu persecution by the state, the church, and those who benefit. Without a cross, the figure is only performing martyrdom, not experiencing it. Without a body, God complex is the regalia of a monster enforcing power structures that subjugate those who worship at its feet, attempting the erasure of those who do not. And then behind this work is, I dreamt I could fly, 60 porcelain arrows in flight, the arrows that our technology and our communities generally um, are, serve us in many ways from protection to providing um, and surviving. The porcelain arrows reference the um, impossibility of that through colonial governments um, taking our tools and giving us ones back that will not suffice in any of these forms. So these arrows will, of course, shatter upon impact. This is another porcelain piece. American talking sticks. Porcelain police batons capable of inflicting life-threatening or life-ending injuries. However, due to the nature of their construction, they're inherently fragile. They can be damaged or destroyed by anything stronger or more durable. Sharply sarcastic title references the customary use of talking sticks by indigenous nations as protocol for ensuring multiple people are provided time to speak, to be heard at a gathering. Talking stick protocol contrasts the blunt force used by settler colonial governments of the Americas, particularly the United States, to silence occupied indigenous nations, black communities and nations, migrant populations, and any community of individual posing as a potential threat to power. The value of sharpness when it falls, iconic example of indigenous tool making and technology, the hatchet. The weight and sharpness wielded in attack or defense and in daily activities of creation and subsistence. Regardless of the force and skill with all these hatchets, this again porcelain hatchet will break upon impact the sharpness of the shards of the broken hatchet are of more use than the, the tool itself. How are we doing on time? Good. Neon American Anthem White. It's a participatory, participatory installation designed to activate the American Gallery at the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, I was recently asked to reimagine the Seattle Art Museum's contemporary American galleries. Um, I kind of already knew what the gallery would look like without seeing it at first. Um, oftentimes in those contemporary 
galleries and museum spaces, there's no indigenous representation of voice at all. Um, Portland Art Museum acquired some work for their collection from me probably 2018 or 19. And uh, I learned that I was the first indigenous artist in their contemporary collection on display in that floor, which you think is a celebration, but it's certainly not. Um, so going to the Seattle Art Museum and visiting this space and seeing the receipt, the receipts of their uh, museum collection, the, the works that are celebrated, the works that are placed beside the contemporary art collection were um, anthropological or cultural at U um, in anthropological context, I suppose. So the ceremonial uh, hats in the, uh, in the gallery next to this installation had been in that space for a long time. Uh, I wanted to do a work that was engaging for the visitors and the viewers um, and also filled the museum with, um, I suppose, how I feel when I get asked to decolonize a museum, um, which was the ask. <laughs> so Neon American Anthem White reads, I've composed a new American national anthem. Take a knee and scream until you can't breathe. This work creates an intersectional space for catharsis, to mourn the loss of lives, freedoms, and safety for people and lands subjected to American violence and to protest continuing oppression. The neon sign embodies capitalism. Its text, pointed reference to the murders of Eric Garner, George Floyd, Tyree Nichols, and all people of color who have been murdered at the hands of police and agents of the American state. Asking participants to take a knee is a position of deference turned refusal to scream until you can't breathe encompasses protest aimed at tearing down the systems built to enforce whiteness, white privilege, heteropatriarchy, and capitalist control. And then a place on the floor are welcome mats. Neon American Anthem Red is another version of this work that's currently on exhibit in Santa Fe, Site Santa Fe. In 2020, I believe, well, maybe 2019, I was invited out to Australia to uh, create some work for the Biennale of Sydney. I was able to fly out in advance and visit with some communities and do some research. Um, one of the things that I came across while there and timing wise was that the 250th anniversary of the landing of James Cook uh, was about to take place. And like most of these governments, any colonial histories are generally heavily celebrated. Uh, I wanted to create a piece of work that spoke to this history. I wanted to create a piece of work that spoke to this uh, James Cook monument or statue that is in Hyde Park. Um, the statue has a discovery plaque on it, crediting Cook for discovering one of the oldest inhabited nations in the world. So the myth of discovery, the, the mental gymnastics that it takes to uh, erase and choose not to see an indigenous community in history that's there for power, genocide, and control. Um, I excavated the shadow of the statue. So this is an aerial shot of that excavation. Um, the work is an excavation of the shadow, following, tracing, and transferring the shadow to the site, the careful excavation retains the shadow shape and reveals what the land holds beneath the surface. 
The Cook Monument's shadow is an embodiment of the shadow of greed, pollution, destruction, cast on the land by corporate capitalist colonization and settlement. By creating a hole large enough to bury the statue, the work's excavation, along with its title, suggests the burial of the Cook Monument itself, along with the burial of destructive governance and the treatment of indigenous land, indigenous people, and indigenous knowledge. Throughout the dig, small flags are placed, marking evidence of indigenous presence preceding Cook's arrival. The excavation of the colonial shadow using scientific practice of archeology span as an art medium turns a practice that originates with colonizers' belief in white supremacy to delivering a layered critique and call for change. The resulting earthwork presents an opportunity to prepare for the burial on land designated as a prison by colonizers of the Cook Monument itself along with the burial of governance and legislation casting shadows of erasure, pollution, and violence against indigenous lives and knowledge. One of the references in this title is um, a bush burial, and I don't think I have an image of that piece here, but a bush burial is a painting that I saw while I was visiting in the National Gallery of S Sydney or somewhere, I believe. Um, and the painting was done in 1890 by uh, a settler named Frederick McCubin. Um, he, in this painting, fabricated the rom and romanticized the settler body. So there was, in this painting, there was a burial happening of the first uh, settler body in Australian soil. Unshadowed land. I was invited in 21, I believe, to do a year-long project at Davidson College in North Carolina. North Carolina. Um, it, it was a time where not a lot of travel was happening, and so it was, you know, trying to trying to create a specific work for a year outdoors um, at a on on a site was was challenging, but I. This was the this was the project. So I had unshadowed land. I worked in conjunction with many community partners, including the Catawba Cultural Center. Uh, exposed the soil and the form and size and shape of the shadow of the Andrew Jackson Monument at Lafayette Square in Washington D.C. Um, this the the site of the shadow was um, transformed into a garden. Members of the Davidson community worked with the Catawba Indian Nation and their Food Sovereignty Working Group to plant Catawba corn into the silhouette. Unshadowed land is an antithesis to, monu to monuments celebrating genocide and enslavement. Instead, it invokes intersection between these expressions of white supremacy, culminating in gestures of acknowledgement, healing, and reconciliation. This work is an unshadowing of land bringing to light the injustices of the settler history of the Carolinas and a move toward cultivation and celebration of indigenous connection to land and continuum of ancestral knowledge. It's an outgrowth of past, current, and ongoing anti-racist work to consider the college's history and establish reciprocal, respectful relationships with native people in the region, including the Catawba. So one thing that I learned while doing this project was that the Catawba corn was thought to have been um, extinct, the seeds, and a researcher, I don't know the exact date, but recently uh, found out that it was not. And the Catawba has been trying to build their seed bank up of this um, important medicinal and sustenance. And working with the college, um, we grew not only in that site, but also with their agriculture department, a larger um, garden of it. And at the end of this, um, harvested the corn and uh, feasted. This was um, somebody's, I think this was a screenshot from one of the uh, Catawba community members. And, I'd learned that some of this was the first time some of them were able to taste it. So, never forget colonial entities 
the U.S. Constitution, current U.S. government, refer collectively to people indigenous to the continental U.S. as Indian. Hollywood's misrepresentations of indigenous people reflect an attempt to justify U.S. policy. The term Indian is a refusal to acknowledge sovereignty and attempts to erase the diversity of over 500 distinct nations pre-existing the invasion of the continent by Europeans. Indigenous land and indigenous communities remain unique, resilient, complex, and beautiful despite over 500 years of occupation by violent settler states. Land acknowledgement has become popular in the 21st century with cultural government entities paying lip service to indigenous existence without meaningful action of land return to indigenous nations. Under US law, Indian reservations are federal lands owned by the US government. Indigenous people living on Indian reservations cannot, for instance, mortgage their homes because banks won't accept a mortgage on federal property. Currently, the titles and rights to less than 3% of land within the United States belong to indigenous people. This work is not a land acknowledgement. Um, it's a call to action. I was invited out to Palm Springs in, I don't, I, I was, I was invited out to Palm Springs probably in 2018 to participate in Desert X Biennial. Um, Palm Springs is Agua Caliente, Cujia territory. And one of the things that I notice when I'm in communities is the chosen identities or narratives that are oftentimes um, placed everywhere. Signage, is there indigenous language on your street signs from those spaces? Um, there was a lot of Bob Hope streets in Palm Springs um, and that type of narrative of the history of Hollywood and where Hollywood goes to play. Um, doing some more research and understanding that the history of the Hollywood land sign was first uh, created as a land advertisement for real estate to um, sell indigenous land to white only segregated communities. Um, the land was removed from the sign and it became an icon to uh, industry, to an industry that, um, that we now identify, I guess, as Hollywood. Um, a film industry that told many stories of portraying uh, indigenous people um, poorly or not at all. That practice still continues today without our own storytellers in these spaces. So I wanted to do work that spoke to this. Um, I submitted my proposal and of course, I said it had to be one to one of the Hollywood sign, um, which is great, but it's, it's massive. So these are 44 foot tall letters and it's 360 feet in length, but the letters are also off the ground, 15 feet, I believe. So um, the, Project was postponed for almost three years while we developed it and found support. <clears throat> and um, <coughs> this was the site. Again, this work is not just about the signage or that history. This work is a call to action. This call to action in this case was for settler landowners to participate by returning legal title of land back to indigenous stewards and care. Um, nobody participated, but I set up a GoFundMe so you could financially contribute as well. And this GoFundMe has still been ongoing. All the funds go to NALC, uh, Native American Land Conservation that um, buys sacred sites and cares for them. Um, <laughs> It was interesting to see the statistics of this work as any piece of work is created, it takes on its own life essentially and you get to see the world engage in ways. And with this work, there was a lot of hashtags and selfies, but there was little, I mean, I, I think we've raised more than that now, probably raised 50 or 60,000 maybe so far, but there was little uh, participation in this side of things which again is, com is as common as a land acknowledgement. Currently, um, 
in Brooklyn Bridge Park. I have a work up. I was invited out a few years ago to visit some sites and do a public art fund piece. So this is my first public art fund commission. <clears throat> this will be up till March. The title of the work is uh, In Every Language There's Land, En Cada Lengua Hay Una Tierra. This is uh, 30 by 30 feet by 15 feet, Corten steel. Um, the steel in this piece was diverted from the US-Mexico border wall construction. Um, there's one source for that, and um, because you can buy anything, we were able to purchase some of it and create this work. So um, for me, this work is about many things. Uh, it's, about, it's about land. It's about indigenous land. It's about immigration and movement. It's about the violence of borders that it continually exists today. This border wall is still being constructed. It cuts off uh, movement to all human and non-human species. Um, it cuts through water. For me, this work references language. Um, in every language, there's land, the title purposefully uh, titled in two colonial languages, so English and Spanish on each side of that border. Um, that border wall and those languages cut through indigenous territories. Those languages removed, uh, are forcefully replaced indigenous tongue and language of those territories and in those spaces. This work references um, the continual struggle related to indigenous resistance, anti-blackness, migrant and refugee issues, patriarchy, police violence, labor movements, genocide. This work speaks to international and, and borders and walls outside of the US, outside of North America and other continents. Um, to scale, that's 30 feet tall, the same height as the US-Mexico border wall with anti-climb plates at the top. Uh, I also reference a Robert Indiana piece in this, if you're familiar with um, the sculpture Love. Um, I think it was important to <laughs> include pop reference in this piece and conversation for many reasons. The, Work's title is a challenge to remember land is sovereign in itself. It's a reminder that, um, oh, here we go. I know that guy. I, <laughs> what I love about this is, is it is not a barrier I love the location with the bridge in the back, which is a connector. Um, this is more of an object you can pass through freely and move through freely um, in contrast to a barrier that's meant to keep something or someone out. Interesting aspects of this with borders in general too. Um, this is Lenape. Oking territory, and one of the first walls on the East Coast was Wall Street, which was put up to keep um, the Lenape off of, out of their own territory, essentially. Um, that wall is no longer a physical wall, but I think it's an economic one for many still. I got one more video I want to share with you, and then I'll open it up for questions. So. Oh yeah, this is Times Square. So this is the work. Um, Brooklyn Bridge. Ik zeg gaan acht genee. Kunnak jak ik ik away wa a. Dat iti nacht zak iti. 
So that's a shorter version of it. Um, there's a two minute version. Uh, this work was also at the Liverpool Biennial. Um, the history of residential schools and, bo and boarding schools in our communities um, is not necessarily just a historic thing. It still impacts our communities to this day. In this work, I speak to my child in Tlingit. The, the language and the words um, spoken are documented affirmations, words of care and love that are shared in our house today. Um, for me, this is a reference to a generation of indigenous children that were not treated with this in residential schools, in boarding schools. Um, for me, this is a reference to our ability to love and care for our generations and communities. The reason I say that this is still impacting us is because generations ago, if you're brought up from someone who has never provided this, it's going to impact your upbringing as well. Um, so yeah, goodness cheese, thank you. So we have just a few minutes if anybody has a question they'd like to ask. Yeah, up here in the front. Um, you created works in a vast range of mediums. Which of these have you found like, um, most like personal enjoyment from? Or are there any that you hadn't yet explored that you've been planning or um, you've looked at in other um, artists' work that you might play more with in the future? Uh. Did everybody hear that? Okay. Yeah, uh, mediums. I, I love all mediums, obviously, but um, I feel like there's freedom in being able to move through different forms of working, and there's a lot of discovery that can happen through that process. Um, I don't know if I have like an idea of something in really trying to get into medium wise I, I I'd like to start with an idea and then whatever tends to be the best form for that we'll negotiate what that medium is so was there another part to that question yeah I was wondering if um, through working with all of these different mediums that you found um, like with the porcelain through the different objects with the god complex you know, there was um, if there were any in particular that you found um, the, the most expressive or? Uh, I, I think it varies again, and it's, it's uh, I mean, music's probably the most expressive that I can think of for me, because I also make music, so, um, yeah. Other questions? Time for one or two more. Yeah. Um, so in your artwork, it's evident that you like to play with scale a lot, and there's many different sizes of pieces. And I'm wondering what to you the significance is of making something really big or maybe a little smaller in a gallery. Um, I feel like that's as important as everything else that could be considered in, in work. So the larger scale work that I've have done, um, particularly the larger, like never forget or this land piece that I was showing you, those are like direct references to um, other fo other forms of scale. So that never forget was one to one to Hollywood sign. Um, this land piece is to scale to the U.S. Mexico border wall, um, which is thirty feet high, and I feel like. Having that scale with that material, when you get to see that work in person, something happens that you understand a little bit more about the conversations that are being held with borders, with um, the brutality of uh, throwing a wall like that up through a border. So, yeah.
I was wondering if when you say get invited to go somewhere or get invited for a project, do you have specific requirements that you can consider? Do you First class, business class, seats. <laughs> No green Skittles. Sorry. The reasons of saying no, do you kind of morally have a code that you follow, or is it monetary based? Or is it um, to if I decide to work somewhere or not? Correct. Um, I think time is the biggest uh, part of that, really. So, with other projects and schedules and uh, like. Um, time and or not not just time to like go do something or be there, but also make sure I have time to conceptualize a piece and understand it. So um, I think that more than anything is an important part. And I have not participated in projects because time more than anything, probably. So, yeah. Thank you for speaking today. I feel like the uh, American education system kind of feels that this persecution of Native Americans is something that's over with and done with. And I appreciate you saying that this is still an active thing that's happening within our society. And it seems like you're kind of taking the role of an educator in this sense. So I was wondering if you could speak on, do you feel like you're an educator to the communities at large here within the US? and? Overseas or how do you I feel see like the, the work has a lot of the work has dialogues or space for dialogue. Um, oftentimes, I mean, some of the works speak specifically to ignored histories. Um, some of the work speaks to uh, things that we've continually been asked to repeat for you know, before even even past generations of artists that have been working in this space are continually asked to repeat 101 conversations. Um, for me, some of the work that I've done in that space will have and hold that conversation without us having to be there and exhaust us every time with it. Um, but yeah, not all of it is um, those things but some of it is a necessity for um, having, uh, for being seen or having conversations in spaces that have actively chosen to uh, erase, so. One more? Um, I see that I really love your work and I see that there's a lot of the pop culture references um, in a way that's very satirical. Can you speak a lot bit more about that? Yeah, I think humor is important too sometimes. Um, and I think pop references can lead to <clears throat> um, a familiar, f familiarity that, of engagement with audiences that oftentimes don't choose to even participate in engaging with uh, indigenous art or indigenous artists in their, or their communities. So. I feel like it could be a, a, ves a vessel or vehicle sometimes when needed. So. Thank you.